Hi everyone, this is Tulio Sergusa with Dojo Live. I'm here again at the GBTA 2019 in Chicago, and I am about to interview the CEO, Aviel Simanto of Fairfly. I'm looking forward to it. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy I've, to be here. Great. Aviel, will you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and how you got to uh, Fairfly? Sure. So uh, my personal background starts with uh, handball. I was a professional handball player for five years. That's what I was the center of my life uh, when, when I was younger. Uh, then I was uh, an infantry, I served in the army for seven years in Israel, the Israeli army. Um, I started studying a dual degree in business and law. Uh, there I participated in an entrepreneurship program uh, called Zell, uh, where we started working on our we started working on Fairfly, um, so that's like how up until Fairfly, and uh, we're working on Fairfly for five years already. Great. So okay, so you were in the Israeli army for seven years. Usually, it's two years, right? Three, three. 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 So three you years. stayed a little longer. Yeah. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Fairfly. What gave birth to this idea about the company? What What is it that you guys do? Sure, so we said, and uh, we were four co-founders in Fairfly, one of us started Waze, uh, Waze, the navigation app, the yes, yes. most popular navigation app in the world, sold to Google for, I think, a billion point two, Uri Levine, uh, and we sat in his living room, I think, about ideas and how we can disrupt the industry, and how we can provide value to potential clients, uh, consumers, corporates, and uh, Uri got a phone call from his travel agent telling him, uh, the price for his ticket dropped. His flight that he already booked, uh, but the ticket for his girlfriend didn't drop. And uh, you would expect the person that sold the company for a billion point two to say, okay, thank you, bye. And, uh, he was really pissed. And I wasn't sure why. And we finished the call and I told him, listen, Uri, I love you. You're one of my best friends. And you're a talented, professional person. But why you're so cheap on that? Like you sold the company for a billion point two. What, what's like six million dollars? What's the big deal? What's the big deal? And he was pissed because other people yeah. don't know that and are overspending. And then we had the aha moment of wait, if we didn't knew about price drops and the tra a single travel agent saved uh, saved Louis six hundred dollars, how big is the impact that we can provide to the industry, to consumers, to corporates? And uh, in the beginning, we were a B2C company providing this uh, uh, service to uh, consumers, finding price drops with flights after they already booked and paid for them. And we quickly realized the opportunity or the problem is way bigger in corporates, in corporate travel. So today we're providing uh, fair tracking solutions to corporates, saving them money on price drops to the same exact flight, saving them around 4% their annual air spend for price ups for the same exact flight that they already booked and paid for. Um, and we also have an additional actionable, actionable insights product that uh, showing them, let's say, empowering them with data and insights of how they can better manage their travel spend, how can they make sure that their travelers are being treated well, uh, what's the breakdown of middle seats, weekends away, like we know as uh, road warriors how it's impactful for travelers, how expensive is attrition in the company, and we help them solve this as well. So that's where we are right now. That's an amazing story. So let me see if I heard this right. Here you have a fairly new billionaire who's not upset that his price drop, he's upset that, that, not the entire, that, all, that everyone doesn't have access to that capability. That's a fantastic, fantastic uh, reason to build a company. So tell us a little bit about how it works. What's what's behind the scenes, the technology, the the infrastructure to make it all work? How do you actually make this possible? Sure. So first of all, in order to make it possible, any company possible, you need to find a problem and fall in love with it, which is exactly what happened to us five years ago. Um, once we fall in love with the fact that with this problem that people don't know, corporates don't know, or way overspending um, that's the biggest thing after that uh, we brought the best team that we can there's a reason why we call the company fair fly F -F not f-a-r-e that's who we are we're transparent we're fair we're friendly and we're here to help so once you you find a big problem and you want to solve it to clients to be to, to create a big impact for them 
that's 90% of what you what you need to have. After that, we hired the most talented developers, product people, sales people, marketing people, uh, to help us take it globally. Uh, at the beginning, you in order to provide these services, you need to connect to the GDSs and then to start bringing new clients, TMC partners. And, uh, today, we're providing these services globally to corporates and SMBs across uh, Amadeo, Saver, Travel Board, three GDSs of Travel Board, uh, and on every country. So, just so I can understand a little bit better, I book a flight or my travel. Uh, coordinator at the office books a flight for me and usually you have like a little window of time to make changes let's say that time has passed and it's four or five days later and the price drops for that flight normally I can't do anything about that right so how is it that you guys could do something about it? how does that work what are, what is tell the audience what they're missing out on here and how, how does that actually happen so first of all in the first 24 hours you can cancel for free Right. Yeah, what we call the void window. Uh, but we find, uh, we see an increase of 70% of savings after void window. So even after we factored in the cancellation fees and everything, for the same exact flight after void window, we find an increase of 70% in savings, which is absurd. It's for the same exact flight. Right, talk about like buyer's remorse. Yeah, so, that, so that's why we're here. The first one is to really show buyers how, how much money they're leaving on the table by, by not using fair tracking. It's like for like. It's the same exact flight that they already booked and paid for. So, but how do you make that work? Is this like something you found a loophole or something that's available, but people just lack the technology to take advantage of it? How does that actually happen? So it's highly complicated. Uh, in order I'm to sure find that it is. It, just trying to get a little gist yeah. of okay. So in, in order to find the savings, you first of all need to know what's the criteria. So what's the PNR? What's the fair rules? If you have baggage in it, uh, if you have any ancillaries, uh, you need to support all GDSs. You need to build, to, to develop a bridge between your product to the GDSs. Uh, and then once you get the PNRs from the client, you need to know how to search and what to search for. And that's a challenge. You can search as much as you want in the GDSs. So we have a very sophisticated engine that can, that is ranking any PNR that we're getting to the system based on a certain criteria and give it a ranking. The, the, gra the grade that the PNR is getting will affect the amount of searches that we will do to this PNR in the GDS. And it can evolve over time because during the void we know it's their cancellation fees. So you might, the PNR might get a bigger grade, but afterwards when the cancellation fees are kick in, uh, we take into account the price of the ticket, or the cancellation fees are correlated to that, if it's, what's the ratio between them, and based on that we define how much search we will, we will uh, conduct afterwards. So it's, it sounds easy, but it's a five years long journey. It, and it's, uh, it's a constant improvement. Uh, it journey. sounds like it would be impossible for an individual or even a group of individuals to go through so many different permutation and possibilities to actually crack the code on doing that. So how do you do that? Do you have some machine learning, AI that you've implemented? What are some of the things that are helping your, your, your company differentiate itself and keep up with these constantly evolving changes so they can grab value to your customers? So first of all, we move extremely fast. We became global, deployed on all the uh, Amadeo, Sabre, Travelport, uh, GDSs, extremely, extremely fast. That's one of our key advantages, that's one of our key expertise in, from development and product standpoints. And from other perspectives, it's uh, it's constantly, and, and yes, we do apply machine learning and AI, but it's in constantly improving our search strategy. And this is only the, the, the first uh, surface Fair tracking is only the first surface of value that you can uh, provide to clients because now with this data that we gather from clients from all of their air spend, now we can also show them and empower them with actionable insights. They can just copy paste to a decision they can take based on specific, uh, let's say specific uh, business units, specific teams, so they can see today the next level of fair tracking, which is the actionable insights platform they can see how their their policy, travel policy, which is usually static, to say the least, uh, they can 
make adjustments based on specific regions or teams and make it highly more productive, effective, and relevant for the team members. So it's also helping the team members travel better and focus on the business and also saving them more money. So the days of the static travel policy that was the same for the entire company and hasn't been changed for two or three years are gone. Now you can update it per specific regions, per specific team in a day, in a week, in a month. Uh, usually it's within a quarter. Sounds like you're making the travel department's job a lot easier in the process. Tell us a little bit about your journey. You said you first started as a B2C company, a business to consumer company. When did you decide to focus more on the business traveler and why was that decision made? We are business travelers and we felt the pain. We felt the pain. I remember the amount of uh, middle seats, uh, red eye flights that I took. I took flights. Uh, I remember the amount. I don't remember the amount of times that I did a red eye flight from Tel Aviv to SFO, 14 hours flight, took meetings all day long, took a red eye the same day to New York, took a meeting all day long, meetings all day long, and then a red eye to Israel. And it's um, it's insane. And I felt the pain. And we all realized that in corporate travel, uh, the problem is bigger. The opportunity and the value that we can provide the corporate and the global travel manager is way, way bigger. So if we're talking about numbers roughly in a year, we're talking about $30 billion that are left on the table each year only for fair tracking. So it's before we add the actionable insights uh, platform that we can provide an even more savings. So um, I hope it answers the question. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you decided to solve a bigger problem, which also happens to have a bigger opportunity as well. Yeah. Um, you're here at GBTA, here in Chicago. What are you looking to accomplish here? Is there anything that you're announcing here? Any? What are you looking to do here? Any new relationships you're looking to establish? Why do you show up at an event like this? First of all, GBTA is the biggest, biggest corporate travel event of the year. I heard that there are seven, eight, or nine thousand people attending it. We have uh, the biggest attendance of our team this year. Uh, we have packed schedule with back-to-back -back meetings with clients. We're triple, quadruple booked. Um, and uh, the goal is first of all meeting our current clients uh, for QBRs, seeing how we can help, because that's the reason why we're here. We're here to deliver value to our clients and to help them in any way we can. Um, so first of all meeting our current clients for QBRs, meeting uh, potential clients, potential partners, TMCs, and other partnerships that we might um, add, and uh, also have fun with our clients, with potential clients, with the team. It's, uh, of the year. You said something I don't often hear a lot of companies do today, QBRs, quarterly business reviews. Yes. It's amazing to me how many companies don't do that. I, it, it, it's a, you know, been in business 30 years, that just seemed like a standard thing many years ago. How did you adopt that? How did that become something that you do? And what has been the value of actually doing those? So, I'm assuming QBR, eyes, you meant quarterly business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> in our eyes, it's uh, it's the basic. Uh, without you know comparing to other companies, uh, we want to be good because we can be good, not because of other companies are doing something different. That's in our eyes what being fair is all about. Being the best that you can. Hearing our clients is the most important thing that we can do. All of us. That's the most important thing. We're sitting in a QBR. We have so many value to provide, which we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, but the QBR is for the client. How are we performing? Are you satisfied? How can we help? What are the challenges that you have for the next three months, six months, a year? That's what the QBR is all about. It's not purely fair flight business review. It's purely client business review. How can we help? What do you want us to help you in the next quarter, the quarter after? How can we improve? So that's, um, I think, being fair with your clients is putting them in the center. And they're the only ones in the center, so that there's nothing outside the client that we care about. It sounds like you're very custom-centric. It's wonderful to hear. Let's shift a little bit about your culture as a company. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the tenants, some of the guiding principles that you have adopted as a company, as a people, that matter to the employees and why they come work at Fairfly? Sure, so we define Fairfly from the first day. You know, life is short, it's short. 
we define Fairfly from the first day as the best working place we ever had and the best working place we'll ever work. That's a high bar to reach because you constantly need to improve it. Constantly need to to achieve to to want to reach it, and, and usually you can, but it's a it's a high goal. So how do you practically do that? What are some of the things you guys do? So let's let's define what's the best working place we ever had and we'll, we'll have. It's uh, it's not it's not necessarily the working place that pays you the most, uh, hopefully, right. but it's it's a place that is fair with you. It's like when you're doing a great job, we will tell you. When you, you can improve something, we will tell you. No politics. We're here to help you grow to prepare you to your next challenge in life. We're here to provide value to clients, but we're also here to take care of our team members. Our team members are a family, and we take care of them as such. Um, we have multiple examples of things that we're doing in the company. We celebrate birthdays to any team member with a brunch the entire company is attending. We're eating lunch together for the past five years, all of us, every day. We're waiting for everybody and we eat together because we value the face-to-face -face time that we have. Uh, and we have, I have multiple other examples, but I think that the main thing is naming it as such. We want to be the best working place you ever had, you ever will have. And it's working with us, not working for us. And uh, no, we, we have all other rules, which I, uh, I'm not sure how camera proof they are, but uh, we bring people that are also we, we look for extremely talented people, but also people that you and I can drink beer with. Right. Because life is too short and you want to work with people that you have fun with, but also help you to take your skill set to the next level, which I'm very proud of because the team is extremely talented and helped me take myself to the next level. I'm smiling because uh, we got a lot of background noise, but that's not why I'm smiling. I'm smiling because the sponsor of Dojo Live, the Airsoft, the CEO often says, we want to work with people that you would be okay going to have a beer with. And it's very people-centric and it's like a family. So it's very refreshing to hear that. What's the most rewarding thing for you as the CEO, having gone through this growth, this evolution, what have been some of the most rewarding moments for you uh, as the CEO? I think the main thing is to bring talented people to have the privilege of bringing the most talented people that I know and met to come work in Fairfly and to not interrupt them in their job. That's, I think, the main thing. I bring people that are 10x better than in me in anything they do. And I'm proud of that. When I interview them, I tell them, I expect you to be 10x better than me. And that's why I'm bringing you. Because I, we want to learn from you. We, we want to provide 10x value to our clients. And the only way to do that is to bring the most talented people in the industry. And uh, one by one, all of our team members, I can vouch for them. Their integrity, their fairness, and uh, of course their professionalism. That's fantastic. If you had to look back with what you've learned so far, it's, but first of all, is this your first uh, startup, your first business? We worked on two different ventures before, but that's, uh, let's say, the way most mature uh, company in the world. Got it. So, in this journey and building this business and attracting great talent and offering something of real value in the marketplace, what have been some personal lessons that you've learned about yourself that you perhaps could share? Wow, uh, there's so much, uh, so many. Um, I think the main one is as a company that is aiming to grow exponentially, you need to invent yourself every day, over and over. You can't stand in one place. You constantly need to, new, to, to learn new skill sets. Uh, you bring people that are more talented than you. That's one thing. And the second thing is to take it to the next level. Uh, I think the, the biggest insight is that um, you always need to learn more and more and more because we as people, we, uh, you know, we grow biologically, but companies uh, that we are we're aiming to grow exponentially and you need to invent yourself over and over and shift the mindset. A company in proof of concept phase is not a company in product market fit phase and not a company in growth phase or hyper growth. And it's a whole different management skills, whole different leadership skills, which I'm, I'm, I'm loving every day of it because uh, it's, it's so challenging. If you, if you had to pick one or two things that you've had to evolve and adapt yourself, what would those have been? There's plenty of people listening here that are either building a company or thinking about building it and 
perhaps could learn some new ways of reinventing themselves along the way because it's very accurate what you did when you did a startup is very different than what you do when you've got market traction and you're trying to get expansion a couple of things that maybe work for you share some practices that are working for you that perhaps some others could learn from as well sure the first one is build a company that you will want to work for that's the thing build a company culture dna that you will want to work for that's that you would want to be an employee of. And it, yeah, exactly got yes, it okay yes. and the second thing is constantly adopt um, improve it along the way when you see things that needs to be improved. that's one of the beautiful things when you build your own company if something is not working you don't need to wait for tomorrow to change it or next quarter you change it now so that's one thing um, the second is be open to changes goes with the first one and the third is find a problem a big big problem it will make a huge impact it will make the world a better place it's a big uh, saying but it will create a big impact to someone it can be a global travel manager a corporate buyer a consumer and fall in love with the problem because the, the, the solution can change and it will change uh, because of technology because of the market because of competition because of the obviously the, the client needs but it's mainly about falling in love with the problem, and that's it, and just go and solve it. And once you have the perfect DNA, or let's say the best DNA you can find and a problem that you fell in love with, it's not, it doesn't feel like work. That's, that's a very interesting way of putting it. You know, you often hear people say, fall in love with the solution. But what I'm hearing is fall in love with the problem first and then develop the solution. Because if you fall in love with the solution, it means that you're not customer centric, you're self centric. It's not what we can do for you, it's what you need from us. And that's a whole different approach. Product will change and should change based on customer feedback. Obviously, take it with a grain of salt, but they, you won't change everything every day. But solving a specific problem. It's the client's problem, not our problem. And they know better than all of us how they will want us to solve it. So that, that's why we're here for, and we're investing a lot of uh, resources in hearing the clients daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and understanding what's the major things that they care about and how we can provide them value. I'm very inspired by that. The sages say that light is found inside the darkness, so you have to look for the darkness. So find the problem, fall in love with the problem. Great words of wisdom, thanks for sharing those. What's next for you guys? What's the next few year trajectory? What are you looking to accomplish as a business, as a, as a CEO? What are, what are, what's next? So we have, wow, we have so many things to do. We only started. We, we only scratched the surface of the value that we can provide the corporates and global travel managers and uh, CFOs and HRs. For now, uh, fair tracking was only the beginning. Now we're providing the actual insights platform, which is next level data-oriented solution. It's next level, uh, providing them with real-time insights on what's happening in their travel span is the next level. And we have many, many things that we want to, to solve to, to both of us. Obviously, there are things that we, we want to build, but the roadmap is being defined by the clients. The clients know best. And uh, we have we have at least a 10 years journey with the things that we want to, to, to solve. So we might do this interview again in a year or five and see how we uh, evolved it since then. But uh, I would I'm, love to do it. Absolutely. We would love to as well. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you and getting insights from you. Uh, I'm sure our audience will appreciate it as well. And I wish you a lot of luck and success at the show here today. Thank you. Thanks for being a guest.